there is something called the corporate average fleet efficiency or the CAFE standards. And in the US, just in the 15 years, the, the efficiency has increased from around 20 um, kilometers per liter of, to beyond 30 kilometers per liter, which is more than 50% increase. Um, that's being brought about by lightweighting the cars, high compression, high efficiency engines, and also by turbo charges. But what's going to happen next is very important, especially with the uh, fleet efficiency standards for Europe. They are not going to talk about kilometers per liter. They are going to talk about grams per kilometer. And the global, all, all cars uh, in the world, the fleet average is about 160 grams per kilometer. Europe is doing a lot better. 120 to 125 grams per kilometer. But the EU is going, I mean, we heard there's going to be more regulations coming. The EU is setting a target for 95 to 102, depending on the weight of the car. There is no way an internal combustion engine can meet those targets. In other words, EU uh, is forcing car manufacturers to go towards hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and EVs. So EVs are coming. This standards are going to be implemented in 2022. And after that, roughly all European companies, they will offer more than 50% cars with some battery in it. It's going to have a disruption to the oil economy, and it will lead to uh, at least the full battery EV will have zero emissions provided the power is coming from renewable sources. In India, we have the Ubers and the Olas, that's the ride hailing and sharing services, or transport as a service. And aut autonomous vehicle, that is the driverless car, we heard about the increase in artificial intelligence. And if you have pattern recognition, uh, probably within the next 10 years, you will see driverless cars. And that would uh, um, automate driving for maximum efficiency. So the mobility transformation is already happening. It is gathering pace, and it's going to be a major disruption. Let's talk about transport fuels. Gasoline, unlike diesel, has higher CO2 per kilometer, not desirable. Diesel has high NOx and SPM, and because of that, it produces smog and it's banned from many city centers. So diesel is bad. Gasoline is bad. Lubes, um, which is what the other product from the refinery, uh, the EV has much less moving parts. It's, in the, it's less than 100 compared to 10,000 moving parts in an internal combustion engine. So lubes in transportation will decline. OECD, the, the club of rich countries, already gasoline and diesel are declining. In non-EECD, they are increasing, mainly in order to have personal transport in places like China, Asia, and India. So globally, already the demand for transportation fuels is subdued. And it's going to peak. When it's going to peak, 
I mean, McKinsey can tell us better, but the projected peak for gasoline is 2025 to 2030. This is within this decade, within this decade for the people in the room, and 2030 to 2035 for diesel. That's not too far away. It's not going to happen in your children's lifetime. It's going to happen in our lifetime. So there's going to be a decline in gasoline and a decline in diesel. Now, the majority of the products from a refinery makes transportation fuels, gasoline and diesel. And if they are no longer there, what happens to refining? So let's talk about refining. The gasoline today, most refiners maximize in 2050. Now, why 2050? Because generally, a refining assets is supposed to last for about 30, 35 years. Um, so in 2050, it's going to be a niche product. Diesel, today, we maximize. It's hard to believe in India that diesel will become a niche product in 2050. Loops, we maximize today. It will be a minor product. Jet, I mean, people who are flying, they will still put some jet fuel. And today, it comes from fossil, that is, from crude oil. In future, a lot of it will come from renewable. And the only thing the bright spot on the refining horizon is chemicals. So now you know why refiners are talking about oil to chemicals. So in future, the product will be mainly chemicals. Today, chemicals is, is a niche product. Uh, it's hard to say in this conference, but it's less than 10% of the refined products. In future, it will be a lot more. Standalone refineries um, will uh, exist, but as, I mean, today they exist only refined products, uh, uh, or what is derogatively termed as the teapot refineries. In future, there'll be no teapot refineries. It will all be integrated, and that will be the rule. So refinery, like Franz Kafka said, will undergo a major metamorphosis. Oil to chemicals. Refining today mainly produces fuel or energy. Tomorrow it's going to produce chemicals or material. There are a variety of ways to do it. We still don't know what is, and it will depend on individual refineries. But we do steam cracking to make chemicals. We make catalytic cracking to make chemicals. We are also looking at dehydrogenation technology to make chemicals. There is MTO, or methanol to olefins, to make chemicals, and catalytic reforming to make chemicals. I won't go into it, but there is an enormous churn in the refining industry towards oil to chemical. So let's talk about the numbers. Average all refineries, 600 refineries in the world, average towards chemical is 7%, a little over 7%. There are some integrated refineries between 10 and 25 percent. Already, China is building some integrated PX projects, 40 percent. Future revamp of refineries will be between 25 and 50, and brand new builds are targeting 70 percent. 70 percent of the crude processed will be chemicals. So. For the chemical industry, the big boys are coming. So let's talk about chemicals. There will be deep refinery chemical integration. A standalone chemical 
will be less competitive and the refineries will evolve for, towards oil to chemical. Major chemical supply will be from refineries. Uh, they will be, um, there'll be mega supply and large players, and it will be, unfortunately, the survival of the fittest. In the case of the demand, there will be no single use or throw away. We will recycle to eliminate plastic waste. There will be much, much lower growth in virgin polymer demand. Plastic will be, uh, uh, um, will be mainly a, a material to substitute metals and other materials. Uh, uh, just to give you an idea, plastic in the world, or polymers or chemicals in the world, uh, polymers and polyester, is roughly about half a billion tons. S steel is one and a half billion tons. Total metals is about four billion tons. So chemicals are going to grow, but by substituting metals. So there will be an evolution to engineering and performance plastic, and there will be an evolution to 3D printing. Now, most people in this audience may not understand 3D printing, but let me explain. Now, today we buy a lot of appliances. One part goes wrong, we throw away. Throw away in future is a bad thing. So there will be 3D printers which will just make that particular part and that appliance will be as new as before. So in chemicals, there will be an evolution of oil and gas majors, the Exxon Mobiles, the shells and the totals of the world, they will become the chemical majors. Let's conclude. The chemical industry, uh, actually the, the topic is very apt. There are going to be major discontinuities and disruption. The mobility transformation is transforming from internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. There is going to be a demand peak and decline in transport fuels that's already in line of sight. The refiners are scrambling to evolve towards oil to chemical. Plastic waste recycling, not in just the recycling, but essentially as a starting material for new plastic will grow. Uh, so that's part of defossilization. You don't start with oil or gas to make plastics, but you start with the waste material. Uh, the chemical products will be prime product plus recycle product and chemical will have a much larger share in the material of the future. Um, so it's going to be a dynamic and a disruptive outlook for chemicals. There will be challenges, but there will be huge, huge opportunities. Thank you very much.